Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. You are attending the second in a three-part series of DBRS Morningstar's ABS methodology webinars. Last week, we conducted one on venture debt that is available on playback on the Bright Talk platform. Today, we are discussing whole business ABS. And on Thursday, our series will conclude with litigation finance. I encourage everyone to join us again in a couple days or revisit any of these talks at your leisure on Bright Talk. My name is Stephanie Ma. I'm a researcher in our structured finance group. And today I am joined by my colleagues, Liz Fitzpatrick and Josh Gatmetten, both SVPs in DBRS Morningstar's US ABS group and the lead analysts for whole business securitization ABS. A few house housekeeping items. Please feel free to type in any questions that you may have throughout the webinar. You should see a question mark on the bottom of your panel. You can click and type in your question. We will address your questions at the end of the webinar. In addition, you should also see a link to a published methodology piece by DBRS Morningstar titled Rating US Structured Finance Transactions, which includes a special appendix devoted specifically to whole business securitizations. DBRS Morningstar's whole business securitization rating methodology was introduced late last year. Liz or Josh, perhaps as a starting point, one of you can just briefly walk us through those developments. Thanks, Stephanie. In early November, we published our methodology for rating whole business securitizations. This formalized our approach to the asset class by providing clarification on suitability and on the screening process of a company, as well as highlighting key analytical factors we would consider. The methodology utilizes a break-even revenue reduction, also known as a haircut, applied to the base case cash flow expectation as the primary driver for determining the rating. We'll also discuss a typical range of net cash flow declines that DBRS Morningstar expects a transaction to withstand at certain rating categories. Great, that's, that's great, Liz. Before we delve into DBRS Morningstar's methodology, for whole business securitizations, perhaps first we can provide a general overview of the market along with what we're seeing in terms of historical issuance trends. Sure, Steph. Um, maybe we uh, take a step back first and uh, briefly describe uh, what whole business securitizations are. So whole business securitizations are securitizations of operating assets in which the sponsor Typically, the operating company or parent company contributes largely all of its predominantly top line franchise or license based revenue generating assets, including trademarks, patents and software, basically all the intellectual property necessary to operate the network. Initial, securitiz initial securitizers in the asset class uh, have been franchised restaurant brands. But eventually this led to many non-restaurant companies such as fitness and wellness concepts, music rights licensing and home services providers uh, as examples, entering the asset class as they have similar characteristics such as diversified operators and locations, contractual cash flows, as well as brand strength and scale, which are key for long-term cash flow generation. And then maybe now is a good time to give some uh, market color, market trends, and issuance trends. Uh, this slide uh, that's being shown, um, a lot of the data is from FinSight here. New issue volume was actually down about 55% in 2022 from record levels the prior year. 2022 ended with approximately six and a half billion of new issuance compared to 14.6 billion total issuance for the full year of 2021, which is record levels. There were 15 transactions in 2022, which is down approximately 34% from 23 transactions that closed in 2021. The top issuers over the last 12 months have mostly been franchise businesses. In particular, uh, QSR food related business businesses dominated the mix of whole business securitization issuers with some educational childcare and spa and wellness companies coming to market as well. Capital structures have typically been two to three tranches 
with a variable funding note and then one or two term notes rounding out the transaction. The typical readings assigned have been in the triple B range for the senior term notes. Typically, these structures feature interest reserves uh, and other credit enhancements to cover interest over a certain period and a backup manager that is in place. Uh, just an additional data point, uh, we looked at what SIFMA had in terms of franchise-related ABS debt. According to them, there's at least $35 billion of these uh, outstanding as of the end of 2021. Now if we can uh, talk a little bit about screening and cash flow sustainability, what factors do we consider when conducting an initial risk assessment? Okay. So a fundamental principle is that the whole business uh, transaction can be rated through the insolvency of the operating company. That is the overarching theme behind the factors that we would consider prior to uh, rating a transaction in this space. We assess factors we believe will impact the stability and predictability of cash flows over a long-term horizon to pay down the notes. We perform an initial risk assessment considering the business model to determine whether we believe the manager can be replaced. It's our view that low operational complexity and decentralized operations would likely make for an easier transition to a backup manager. Uh, next, operating history and longevity of the brand over economic cycles. The scale of the operating company is also very important. Generally, larger scale helps support the argument that the brand can continue after an insolvency. Uh, market position, brand strength, um, reputation, um, elasticity of demand, needs-based versus uh, consumer preference-based, also important to consider. Um, we look to identify any risks of potential obsolescence in a revenue stream, which would cause us to either discount or exclude that component of cash flow altogether. Um, operating efficiency, meaning the value proposition for the individual franchisee or operator, um, all, all pointing to the stability and predictability of cash flows. Thanks, Liz. That, that seems to cover kind of the the risk assessment and what we consider. Are there any other things on the sustainability side? I don't know if Josh, you want to uh, kick in here. Sure. Um, so we typically work uh, with our corporate rating colleagues in formulating a view of a particular business uh, to basically identify and analyze business risks for the underlying company. Uh, with a broad emphasis there on the sustainability of operations and revenue stability and predictability. So DBR, DBRS views companies that either operate in industries with high barriers of entry or effective, effectively differentiating themselves from competitors as being in a stronger position to generate long-term cash flows. Also, businesses with lower operational complexities are often more likely to continue functioning should the entity experience stress and a backup manager has to step in to perform core duties. And, and once this initial risk assessment and the transaction screening phase are completed, I would imagine that we also conduct an operational risk review of some kind as well. Yes, that's extremely important. As with other operating assets, the collateral here is non-self-liquidating, so more active management is required in extracting value from those assets, which are generally franchise fees or license agreements. In these transactions, the operating company typically assumes the role of the manager, handling key aspects of the business, such as supply chain and marketing functions, as well as strategy. This underscores the need for an experienced manager in this role. It's also vital to have an acceptable third party backup manager in place prior to the closing of a transaction 
to ensure a smooth transition in the event of a manager termination. We have a dedicated team performing the operational risk reviews for these roles. Maybe we can expand a bit on, on that concept a bit more, these, these various roles, particularly that of the manager and, and how they are incorporated into our analysis of the transaction. Yeah, sure, sure, Steph. So it's it's key that the basic functions of a manager are able to be assumed by a back of manager in order to preserve the continuity of cash flows. Because a true sale of the assets to a bankruptcy remote SPV isolates the revenue generating collateral from the operating company in the event that the operating company files for bankruptcy. So some of the core tasks uh, involved here include supply chain management, manufacturing, uh, maybe marketing and distribution functions. So the presence of that committed backup manager to immediately assume these duties safeguards against uh, interim disruptions and in cash flow generation. In case of a manager termination and until a, ma a successor manager can be appointed. Now, one aspect of this is uh, the management management fee in these transactions. So these are these these management fees are precisely sized to support uh, the basic level of operations uh, that are needed to support the transaction. So as mentioned, the guiding principle in whole business transactions is the ability of the rated debt to continue to be serviced through an insolvency of the operating company or manager. Maybe we can dovetail a bit and go into the structural side of things and what you're seeing there. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so most of the structures in whole business are fairly standardized. Um, I may have mentioned earlier, typically there's one tranche that is a uh, variable funding note and uh, only privately offered, uh, plus one or, or or more um, fixed rate term notes uh, that are issued all out of a master trust. Uh, sometimes there are several series of these notes. Uh, in terms of legal finals, typically they're 30 year uh, and they will have um, anticipated repayment date features uh, anywhere from five to seven years typically. The some proposals I've seen 10, 10 years. Um, and then prior to an ARD, uh, there's typically there's scheduled principal of 1% per annum, but that's not required to be paid uh, if typically in, in certain deals, the senior leverage ratio is at or below, usually set at five times. So this is known as a fall away provision. And this is what you've seen for, for the most part in these deals. Other structural features or more, more, mostly protections to mention include rapid amortization events, cash flow sweeps or trapping events, and manager termination events. Uh, these events are often tied to DSCR coverage ratios. Uh, some have it tied to system-wide sales or other measures of profitability, or the breaches of certain covenants uh, or events of default. Rapid amortization events usually result in diverting all proceeds to fully pay down the notes for the payment priorities. There are also covenants and other limitations on the non-securitized debt that the company may incur. So our ratings address the terms set forth in the transaction documents, which typically is for the timely payment of interest and ultimate payment of principal by the legal final maturity. We do not rate to the anticipated repayment date, which I think is a key point to make here, uh, nor do we rate to the typically subordinated step up interest associated with uh, missed uh, anticipated repayment date. Josh, you, you touched on you know one one aspect of our rating, but perhaps we can go into Liz or Josh more detail about uh, the the various tests that we conduct and the analysis that that goes into arriving at the rating. Sure. Uh, so DBRS Morningstar tests the transaction maximum ability to withstand stresses in the form of a day one revenue haircut in order to determine break even levels where the rated notes are unable to be repaid by the legal final. We take more of a long term view 
and may consider compensating features such as reduced leverage, higher schedule principal amortization, and other protections, in addition to qualitative risk factors determining in determining those levels. As an example, for a triple B rating, we would expect to see a range of break-evens uh, to be between 40 and 55 percent. Uh, these ranges were derived from an analysis pro uh, produced by one of our quant teams of cash flow declines experienced within a data set of public corporations. We also want to point out that the break-even haircut has always been included as a cash flow stress uh, that was applied to whole business transactions when they were initially rated uh, here. And it is uh, it was generally the most conservative of the stress rounds. And what about on the legal side? I'm, I'm sure there must be legal considerations that we also undertake. Yeah, that, that's right, Steph. Um, there are um, pretty significant um, legal considerations, especially in whole business securitizations. Um, we look for the standard asset isolation provisions and opinions. We look for the transaction documents and opinions to be consistent with our uh, DBRS legal criteria and that a company's assets are properly ring fenced from any of the company's other creditors as well as having a clear understanding of the line between securitized and unsecuritized entities. DBRS also considers um, intellectual property matters related to the transfer. And I'll mention that, you know, there's significant focus on the quality of the security interests uh, in these cases. Key documents reviewed include underlying franchise or licensing agreements and management and backup management agreements apart from the, the typical review of um, other governing docs and opinions. So definitely a more extensive uh, legal review than in many other structured finance asset classes. Thanks, Josh. Well, we provided a very high level overview of our methodology approach, but again, I encourage others to check out our published methodology, which includes an appendix devoted to whole business securitizations. This concludes our prepared remarks for the webinar. Now we will open the discussion for Q&A. Again, you should see a question mark on the bottom of your panel, which you can click on and type out your question. Allow me to look and see if we have any. Josh or Liz, do WBS issuers have to be franchises. Okay, I will take this one. Not necessarily, although the franchise model is probably the, the best example of what works in this uh, asset class. It illustrates the inherent diversification qualities in terms of sources of cash flow generation, geographic distribution of operations, and decentralized operations via the often hundreds or thousands of franchised operators, making them particularly well-suited for a uh, whole business. Certain license-based arrangements and kiosks also have many of those same features and are found in uh, the rated whole business securitizations that are out in the marketplace right now. Thanks, Liz. Last call for questions. Oh, I see one more. How actively is the backup manager at the start of the transaction? Um, I can take that one, Steph. Um, so the backup manager is already involved at the beginning of all transactions. Uh, first of all, they, they have to be signed on and committed uh, prior to closing. Uh, they're involved in a, in a, the sizing of the management fee, which we mentioned earlier, as well as ongoing monitoring of the transaction. They they can either be in what's called uh, typically a cold or hot backup phase where, uh, depending on the state, the state of the transaction, the performance transaction, uh, with the objective that they basically are made aware of the latest on the company and be ready to assume uh, their duties as backup. 
as needed to support the transaction. Thanks, Josh. Let me just check. Last call. Okay, I, I believe we have addressed all the questions posed. We want to thank everyone for taking time out of your day to join us. Special thanks to Liz and Josh for sharing your invaluable insights on the whole business securitization sector. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for playback should you wish to revisit any discussion points or perhaps share the replay with your colleagues. And again, this Thursday at 2 p.m., we will conclude our methodology series with litigation finance. Then next week, we will start our outlook series on consumer ABS, followed by commercial ABS the following week. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.